Hello, I'm with Charles Goodhart, a Professor Emeritus of Banking and Finance at the London School of Economics and a former member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England and personally my favorite central banker. So uh, Charles, thanks for agreeing to be uh, interviewed by us, sharing your insights. Um, I want to start by asking uh, what you've been doing over here. I gather you just came back from Beijing. Could you, right. could you share some of the uh, discussions with us without giving too much away? Well, I began in the morning by giving a lecture at Renmin University, which regards itself as the London School of Economics of China, as the leading social science university in China. And uh, I talked to them about how we macroeconomists had failed to foresee this particular crisis. So that it was a crisis of macroeconomics as well as a crisis uh, of the financial system and a crisis of Europe. And then I went and did more or less the same in the afternoon at the Bank of China. And what do you think were the mistakes made largely by the, the mainstream economics profession? Oh, really very simple. Uh, the basic macroeconomic theory that we've mostly been working on, which known, is known technically as a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, for various reasons, including the need to simplify, in fact excluded all financial frictions uh, from the model. It excluded default, it excluded financial intermediaries, it excluded risk premia, and really it excluded money as well. So everything that a central bank ought to be interested in were excluded from the model. And that was, I, I, in my view, absolutely incredibly, the kind of models that most forecasting is forecasting institutions, including central banks, have used. So it excluded everything that was really interesting in the financial system. Did you see that yourself when you were on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England? Because I always had a sense that they approached these things with a, a greater degree of sophistication than a lot of the central banks. Uh, fortunately, it was rather a calm and gentle period when I was on the Monetary <laughs> Policy Committee. It was in 1997 to 2000. We had the Asian crisis, and for about two months, there was a concern in the West whether the Asian crisis was going to feed over into the financial systems of the West. And for a couple of months, we would send round surveys to the major banks in the UK uh, asking them whether there were any liquidity or other problems and whether they were, they were changing their uh, credit e expansion conditions. And the answer was no. And then really very quickly, by about uh, October that year, uh, the problem eased up a great deal, partly because China um, and Hong Kong stood very firm against the contagious problems that occurred uh, in, the, in that period. Of course, one of the reasons why China could do that was because they didn't have full capital account convertibility. And I find it interesting that uh, when one speaks to the uh, People's uh, Bank of China these days, that um, it's almost as if the last few crises, both in the 1990s crisis in, in Asia and the more recent one, the uh, global uh, uh, re recession in 2008, um, are, are viewed as speed bumps, uh, which may be slowing down the uh, uh, move towards full capital account convertibility. But there's, there, there hasn't been a fundamental rethink of, the, of that position, I, I don't sense. Uh, I know it's true, and, and they were treated as speed bumps, and the Chinese response to both crises uh, was very beneficial to the world more generally, and I think the world is appreciative of what went on. Uh, but I think that there is a realization uh, that China has got to uh, adjust its internal financial conditions before it can undertake capital liberalization, and there's quite a lot uh, that China still has to do in terms of financial reform if it wants to liberalize its, 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 its uh, international capital arrangements, with, uh, get rid of its controls. So it's not going to be, I think, in any way uh, a rapid development. Where do you think the weak links are? I mean, one hears a lot about the Chinese shadow banking system, which strikes me as being something akin to a, um, a large scale of private loan sharking. It's, it's not really at all like our shadow banking system. Uh, I, I was wondering what your impressions were. <laughs> well, I'm not an expert on the Chinese financial system, uh, but I, there is the, the uncontrolled system, and then there's the controlled system. And when the controlled system it, it, has various constraints on the interest rates that it can charge. 
and there's a natural tendency for funds to flow into the uncontrolled system and then on to people who can't get funding in any other direction. And this is always likely to be a, a weakness. Um, there, I, I remember, I know all too clearly, I'm afraid, when we undertook uh, our financial liberalization in mm. the UK in 1971-72. And the result of liberalizing interest rates was the most enormous uh, credit and monetary expansion in 73-74, which caused a lot of problems. So the, the Chinese have got to worry. I think the main worry for the Chinese is, is how you liberalize the internal financial system. And that takes precedence over the question of whether there should be a complete uh, freedom of capital movements. Um, at the risk of sounding heretical, has there actually been a country which has benefited from financial deregulation? I mean, if you look at the U.S., for example, its golden age of capitalism came uh, in the, from the 19 uh, after the Second World War to the 1970s, when. By and large, the financial system was uh, pretty tightly regulated, uh, similarly, I think, in Europe and uh, in, in Asia. Um, and I can't think of a, a time in which uh, financial deregulation, per se, has actually enhanced uh, uh, global economic performance for a particular country. Well, you have to remember that those period, those years, were in many ways um, not entirely wonderful for a large groups of borrowers. Uh, for example, People nowadays keep on worrying about money going to small and medium enterprises, SMEs. Well, I can tell you that before the financial deregulation, the SMEs got nothing. I mean, they simply had to rely on their own resources. Because when you get interest rate controls and direct controls and lending, the banks naturally lend to their biggest and their safest and their longest standing borrowers. Mm -hmm. I and mean, you know, it's what you would do. Mm -hmm. And the SMEs are always going to be marginal. And the marginal borrower under that kind of controlled system gets nothing. And indeed, the, the household borrowers were, in, at any rate in my own country, tightly controlled. There used to be what was known as mortgage famines. Um, and unless you had held a lot of money for a long time with a building society, you stood no chance of getting an advance. And in those days of financial controls, we had direct credit controls mm -hmm. from 1945 until 1971, 72. During that period, the only training that a bank manager needed was to how to say no gracefully. Because anybody who wasn't big, wasn't known, wasn't well established coming to a bank for a loan, the answer was no. So if what you are asking for is a world in which the marginal borrower, including SMEs, is ruled out of be obtaining, a, being able to obtain finance. And in many ways, that is not entirely desirable. Now, there are many things that have gone wrong mm -hmm. uh, with our financial system, and I could tell you <laughs> quite a number of them, and you could tell me quite a number of them. But I think enabling a wider range of borrowers to obtain bank finance is not among the things that have gone wrong. Can I ask you a broader philosophic question as a former central banker? Um, do you think central banks in the last few years have done too much or too little? I think, I think that the central banks have saved the system after the crisis. And I think the allowing Lehman's Brothers simply to be liquidated, in effect, in the liquidation in London, the liquidation in Tokyo. And the Americans saved Lehman Brothers New York. They took no notice of Lehman Brothers London, no notice of Lehman Brothers Tokyo. They allowed all that to get liquidated in a very disorderly way. And they left a system in which knew, nobody knew what the rules now were. And one of the situations, conditions that worries me now very much is that in Europe, after Cyprus, mm -hmm. nobody knows what the rules are of bailing out or dealing with the bank that is failing. We no longer know how it may be handled. And it's that kind of uncertainty that causes all kinds of difficulties. And of course, in Europe, you have a, a well, in the the monetary union countries, you have a diff, uh, an additional complicating factor, which is that um, the deposit insurance guarantees um, can't be credible in if they're not ultimately backstopped by the European Central Bank. Uh, I mean, if you look at the UK, for example. Um, one of the reasons why the deposit run at um, Northern Bank was uh, arrested so quickly 
uh, was because of the fact that um, you had ultimately had it was ultimately backed by Her Majesty's Treasury, and um, and and th therefore it was a credible uh, uh, guarantee. Whereas in Ireland, which I think had banking assets uh, as a percentage of GDP roughly the same as in the UK, uh, that wasn't credible because um, you know the, everyone rightly asks where are the Irish going to get the money from. Well, the Northern Rock case, um, I mean, we had deposit insurance before that, and a lot of people who withdrew the money uh, either didn't know about deposit insurance. And there's another factor as well. It's not just whether you get your money back, it's how quickly you get your money back. And under the deposit insurance guarantees that existed in Europe prior to Northern Rock, you didn't necessarily get your money back for up to three months. And your money in the bank is basically what you need for transactions. And it doesn't matter if you think that you're going to get 100% of it back. If you're going to have to wait three months, you're going to line up and ask for it immediately. Mm -hmm. So it's not only whether you get it all back, it's the speed with which you get it back. And the people lining up to get their money back, uh, I were worried that they, even if they were going to get it all back, Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't be available for long enough to cause them considerable discomfort. The, the other reason I ask the question is because uh, in many respects I have profound sympathy with uh, uh, people like Ben Bernanke and, 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 and Mervyn King uh, because I feel that they are being forced to step into the breach, uh, in effect uh, daring off, being forced to go where politicians dare not go uh, because you've had, for reasons of political function, blind ideology, whatever you want to call it, uh, there's been a disabling of fiscal policy um, and that's come at a time when you still have relatively high unemployment, um, a low aggregate demand um, and, and the central bank seeing that the political process is paralyzed are in fact saying well we have to fill the gap and yet they, they don't have the right kind of tools to do that. I think that's to a large extent true. I think they've used in some respects the wrong tools uh, to try and restore the situation. But it's not that the political process is, is broken so much as, as you say, uh, the fiscal route is uh, prevented by various factors, ideological and otherwise, which means that quite often it's the politicians who are pressing the central banks to go further. I mean, that's very much true in Japan, uh, where Abe appointed Kuroda precisely because he was unhappy with the degree of of aggressive expansionism, or rather lack of it, uh, that Shirakawa had before. And it's very clear in the UK that Osborne is hoping that Carney will pull his chestnuts out of the fire. Uh, and that it also appears to be clear, I don't know how much truth in it, that Osborne was upset that Sir Mervyn King was not prepared to be as unconventionally aggressive as he, Osborne, had wanted. So the politicians are pressing the central bankers to do more, perhaps more in some cases than the central bankers themselves would like to do. Do you think quantitative easing as a whole has been effective? The first round of quantitative easing was a superb success. It was absolutely essential, it was necessary. It halted a very, very sharp downward spiral. Uh, after the first round of quantitative easing, for a variety of reasons, I think the effectiveness of quantitative easing has been declining uh, and the central bank should have been looking at other kinds of instruments and other mechanisms for bringing about a restoration uh, of the financial system and of the economy more broadly. Of course, the, there is a contrary view, which is that um, you know, under the uh, Labour government, uh, you, you had the fiscal deficit there to a sufficiently large level, 10% uh, uh, of GDP, which helped to stabilize demand. And that's what actually uh, put a floor on the economy. And um, uh, uh, quantitative easing came at the same time, but then when the Tories came in, the introduction of fiscal austerity actually began to undermine that growth. You, uh, what do you think of that? Uh, well, we uh, haven't had much fiscal austerity, and you talked about the deficit of 10%. Mm -hmm. What do you think the deficit is going to be this year as percentage of GDP? Uh, probably uh, c pretty close to that, but uh, I exactly. would, but, but that's a With large ours, <laughs> ours, ours is still the second largest deficit in the UK, and we've been, I, there's been an enormous amount of sort of talk about austerity. There actually hasn't been very much, of which I'm rather glad. Um, and in many ways, I'm, I'm very pleased that Paul Krugman and, and Bob Skidelsky and others keep on complaining about the austerity. Because what we've had is not very much austerity, and ex a, a quite expansionary monetary policy, very low real interest rates. And we've managed to, if you like, keep 
bubbling along along the bottom, despite the fact that our main export market, uh, certainly currently, is headed downwards really rather fast. Um, I, I'm not that, I, given the conditions in which the UK finds itself, I'm not that really upset or depressed about the UK as such. In praise of political function, dysfunction, we might say. And on that pleasant note, I think we'll, we'll leave it. But thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights with us. It's been much appreciated. Well, it'll be most enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs>